Right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Xinwei Fang, a research associate working on trustworthy autonomous system nodes in resilience. I'm assisting Professor Radu Kalinisku in organizing this seminar series. Today, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Xingyu Zhao. Xingyu is an assistant professor in safety critical system at the Verification and Validation Group, WMG, University of Warwick. Xingyu is also an honorary researcher at the Department of Computer Science, University of Liverpool, and a program fellow at the Assuring Autonomy International Program. Before joining Warwick, Xingyu was a lecturer uh, in AI at the University of Liverpool and a PDRA in Howard Watts University. Xingyu received his bachelor and master degree from Beihang University and joined the Center for Software Re Reliability, City, University of London, and obtained a doctoral degree in computer science. We are very much looking forward to your talk, and it's over you, to you, Xingyu. Okay, thank you, uh, Xinwei. Uh, before I start, just to make sure, um, I might share my screen because I cannot see a green box over my monitor. Uh, so you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah, I okay. did. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, then I will just start. Uh, thank you again for um, inviting me um, in this talk, uh, this great opportunity to give this talk to the uh, prestigious TAS uh, community. And the topic is about uh, evaluating safety critical systems, a conservative business view. Uh, for some of you may have problems to pronounce my name, uh, you may call, uh, simply call me Xingyu. That would be uh, uh, yeah, that would be good enough. And um, currently, uh, I'm a assistant professor at uh, WMG, University of Warwick. Um, actually, I just joined Warwick two weeks ago. And um, regarding the title, I would like to make two notes here. Uh, the first, you can see that I'm uh, putting this keyword conservatism uh, inside a bracket because technically uh, there is no difference between being conservative or being optimistic. The notion of uh, being conservative really depends on the application context. So it is not a technical notion. So here uh, we are dealing with uh, dealing with safety critical systems. I presume we all like to be uh, conservative. But say if you are working in uh, some other domain like finance, you would like to be uh, optimistic, no problem. All the techniques I'm mentioning uh, in this talk today can still apply. So that's a first um, disclaimer. And second, I have this keyword of uh, uh, BSN in the title. And yet, yes, I was trained to be a uh, BSN statistician in my PhD study. And I will not, I will not touch the topic, the debate between frequentist versus BSN in this talk. So it, basically, it's just the two different mindsets of uh, modeling the world. Uh, although personally, I prefer uh, to be BSN a little bit. OK. so. Um, let me use, okay, yeah. So before the technical part, uh, I would like to mention my working experience because most of the works I'm talking um, today um, are actually joint works with the following groups. So I started my PhD uh, 10 years ago, time flies. Uh, at CSR, uh, stands for the Center for Software Reliability, City University of London. And in that post uh, PhD, project, I have been mainly working on uh, probabilistic assessments of safety critical systems, uh, including nuclear power plant protection systems. And uh, then I did my first postdoc at Harvard University, uh, where I started to do probabilistic verification for uh, robotics and autonomous systems. Meanwhile, thanks to uh, Radu's help, I became a program fellow at the uh, Assuring International, uh, Assuring Autonomy International Program, University of York, uh, mainly working on runtime uh, verification assurance of robots. And then I did my uh, second postdoc at University of Liverpool, working on safe AI topics like uh, deep learning testing, defense attack, deep learning models, expandable AI, doing safety analysis for the ML systems. But those topics will not be covered by the talk today. And uh, 
Um, yeah, I started, then I started my first lectureship uh, in AI at the Department of Computer Science, University of Liverpool, and uh, joined Warwick as a assistant professor in safety critical systems uh, recently. And in, th in, in, in this talk, I will cover uh, 11 uh, joint publications with aforementioned groups. I have a list at the end of the slides. So after this talk, if you, something looks interesting to you, we, we can uh, have a discussion. You can feel free to get the uh, access to the publications. Um, yeah, so I would like to begin with this very uh, general question of why assessing safety critical systems hard, say comparing to uh, assessing the fairness of a coin. Uh, as you can see, I'm trying to use this table to highlight all the difficulties I, I feel. Um, so as you can see here, we have two columns. The first column is regarding assessing a coin. The second one is about assessing a safety critical systems. And the first row says, the metrics we use for assessing the fairness of a coin is very easy to define. We can simply say, uh, let's use the probability of seeing a tail in the next toss, okay? And the ground truth is roughly around, we all know that, 0.5. But for safety critical systems, uh, what metrics should we use? There are some common metrics suggested in uh, safety standards, like this uh, PFD stands for the probability of failure per random demand. And uh, presuming for sure you are dealing with a on demand systems, and the ground truth is normally very small, around say 10 to minus 4, if you are targeting at sales level 4 system. And now you can see the meaning behind this new metric PFD is not as straightforward as the probability of seeing a tail in the next toast because everyone in the end knows what is a tail of a coin and how to do a flip of a coin. But you may need more careful definitions of what is a failure in PFD? What is a demand in the PFD, behind the PFD, PFD metric, okay? And that actually determines how you need to conduct your trials, conduct your tests uh, so that you can estimate PFD, this metric. And the ground truth of PFD, as I mentioned, is, no, uh, is normally very, very small, which is very expensive to uh, evaluate. And this is actually related to the second row in the table. Uh, loosely speaking, we know that the smaller the probability you would like to uh, evaluate, the more trials, the more testing you need to do so that you can have a high confidence in your uh, estimation. So, uh, for the coin, we only need to uh, do a few flipping uh, to estimate 0.5 probability with high confidence. But for uh, critical systems, it normally requires a impractical number of expensive testing for critical systems. OK. Um, then on the third row, I'm highlighting the assumptions behind stochastic process. Uh, for most of us, we have no problems of assuming uh, the flipping of a coin as a sequence of Bernoulli trials, right? But the stochastic failure process of a safety critical system is much more complex. And we may have doubts in those uh, fundamental assumptions behind a stochastic process we use, say, the common uh, binomial process or Poisson process. Um, and next, uh, to run the Bayesian machine, we need to have priors, okay? And for a coin, again, everyone knows a coin very well, and we may easily derive a prior distribution, say a normal distribution around 0.5, some variance based on uh, historical uh, yeah, data, whatever. But again, for critical systems, people are actually very careful and reluctant to express any prior knowledge, and they should do that. That's, that's, that's okay, that's great, they should do that. So when we assess safety critical systems, we may end up with some very limited prior knowledge. Okay, so what can we do here? And also we cannot, we cannot simply use non-informative priors for safety critical systems because they will introduce implicit knowledge and being very misleading in the assessment. Okay, and um, yeah, and often, uh, 
Bayesian methods uh, rely on conjugacy for uh, mathematical convenience. And this might be okay for assessing the fairness of a coin because in the end, it is not a critical system. But for safety critical systems, conjugacy again may introduce implicit knowledge by assuming certain parametric families of the, uh, of the prior uh, the, the, the shape of the uh, prior distribution, right? So how can we justify that shape? We can, we cannot. So we cannot simply use uh, non-informative priors for critical systems. Okay, and often, um, I'm sorry. Finally, I would say uh, the implication context of flipping the coin could be very simple, say in some uh, gambling games. But for safety critical systems, their application contacts are very much more complex, dynamic, and sometimes interactive. Uh, say um, in a uh, safety components used in a robotics and aut autonomous uh, missions. And uh, yeah. So corresponding to uh, those five rows I'm highlighted in the uh, table, I have been thinking the following six questions in my research. And I would say they are not isolated at all. They are actually uh, correlated uh, questions. So the first one, how to uh, practically assess ultra high reliability um, with clear definitions of the metrics we use and the physical meanings behind those metrics. And second, for safety critical systems with a practical amount of testing, we may only see failure-free evidence or very sparse failures. Indeed, yeah, indeed, when we do see uh, some failures of safety critical systems, we normally will update those systems, uh, making the failure data obsolete anyway. So what is the best way to model failure-free evidence or sparse failure evidence in our reasoning. So that's the second question I'm thinking. Um, third, we know that any, okay, any modeling work reflecting the real world are based on some assumptions. Similarly here for the uh, stochastic process we use for our safe critical systems. So whenever we have doubts in those fundamental assumptions, how can we incorporate the doubt in our reasoning? Okay, and next, in practice, we may only have limited partial and very weak prior knowledge. Okay, we sometimes we don't have the luxury of having a complete distribution, very precise, very specific prior distribution. We can only have partial limited weak prior knowledge. In that case, what shall we do in Bayesian inference? And also, can we get, or get rid of the controversy in Bayesian reasoning? And finally, how to model safety critical systems in a more uh, dynamic, interactive application context. As you can see, the resource question one and two, six are somehow specific to uh, safety critical systems. The question three is more generic to any safety, uh, sorry, uh, statistical inference problem. And question four and five are fundamental to any Bayesian approaches, I would say. Um, yeah, so as you can see, all these six questions I'm asking are actually very hard and fundamental. And I cannot claim in my past research, uh, we have perfectly solved them. But hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, you may find some interesting ideas, solutions from um, our works. Yeah, so Next, um, yeah, so in this talk, um, I would like to use this run study as our uh, motivating example. Uh, this is actually a very famous study. As you can see, uh, it has picked up many citations in the past few years. And the title pretty much explains what they have done. Okay, so driving to safety, how many miles of driving would it take to demonstrate autonomous vehicle reliability? OK, so basically the context is autonomous vehicles have been tested on public roads in the US and now also in the UK for many years. And the millions of autonomous miles have been driven. And we wonder what exactly can we claim from those evidence, from those testing results. Um, and in their study, one of the metrics uh, they use is this PFM, stands for the probability of fidelity in event per driven mile. 
Okay, and uh, they use a very common, very common frequentist statistical inference model to estimate this metric, this metric PFM, and trying to claim uh, the autonomous vehicle is sometimes better, say 10 times, five times, or as safe as human, average human drivers with certain level of uh, confidence. And the main conclusion from the study uh, includes, they say, um, operational testing alone is not good enough to claim anything useful. Okay, so to give you an example, they say to claim a car is uh, as safe as human as safe as human drivers with 95 confidence. Uh, it actually requires 275 millions of fatality-free miles, and this is something impractical. We can never do that in the reality. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say for sure we fully agree with the run study results. But to be honest, the main message from this run study is not new at all. Back to the 70s, we already knew the main message uh, from the reliability community. Uh, and I can refer you to these two papers I'm highlighted on the slides. Um, but to be fair, the run guys, they did a very good job in terms of reformulating this problem for uh, autonomous driving vehicles. And for sure, we know that statistical testing alone is not good enough for safe critical systems for self-driving cars, but, but, but no one deploys self-driving cars or any statistical, uh, sorry, safety critical systems for statistical testing without very strong prior confidence in safety. Otherwise, your car could be a killing machine on the public road, right? It would be too risky. No one will do that. So instead of just modeling testing evidence like what the right people did, how can we actually incorporate strong prior knowledge in safety in our reasoning? So that's the question I'm thinking. And whatever the solution is, this should be done in a statistical principled way. And to me, Bayesian method seems to be a good answer because Bayesian method, it is a principled framework and it has the unique advantages of embedding prior knowledge. Okay, move on. Yeah, so, so what is a Bayesian inference? Let's do a very quick reminder. Say we have a prior distribution of the failure probability x denoted by this uh, function uh, f of x. Then seeing some uh, testing data, uh, we may update this prior distribution uh, in the figure, this, this is red curve, into a posterior distribution according to the like loop function. So that is, we can say seeing uh, data, okay? the prior distribution is scaled into a poster distribution according to the uh, likelihoods. As you can see, I'm highlighting three keywords in this sentence, the prior, the posterior, and the uh, likelihoods. So um, yeah, accordingly, we need to think of the following three questions whenever we use a uh, Bayesian approach. The first one is where to get the prior, where to get this f o x. If you are happy to use some distribution as your f of x, then that's good, that's okay. But in reality, sometimes we cannot, okay? Shall we simply use a uniform prior or non-informative uh, non prior for safety critical systems as our f of x? That's a question mark. And second, what would be the likely fun likelihood function? Shall I simply use a Poisson binomial Bernoulli processes whatever uh, those common ones they use. Okay, but what if I'm not 100% sure that is how my system being operated? My safety critical systems may not feel exactly in that uh, way. Okay, so in this case, I have some doubts. What can we do? And finally, what, what would be the form of posterior of your practical interest. I'm highlighting this keyword practical because for sure, if you like, you can calculate the complete posterior distribution when you know your f of x, when you know your l, which is the electrical function. But normally that would be too uh, costly. Okay, we, and actually we don't need to know the whole uh, posterior distribution. In most cases, we only need to know some uh, 
some statistics on the Postgre uh, distribution, like a Postgre mean or some quantile, some confidence bonds for your given application context. Okay. Um, yeah, so now um, let's refer back to the uh, autonomous vehicle example and think of the question regarding priors. Uh, I'm giving you an example, say we are interested in a posterior confidence bond uh, as shown in this equation one, that is, um, what is the probability that X, which is uh, PFM, stands for probability of fidelity per mile, smaller than a required bound P. This P could be given from the regulators or engineers, assessors, whatever. After, after seeing some evidence on the roads, say K fatalities in N driven mile. Okay, so that is equation one is our objective, is our posterior uh, we'd like to know. And to tackle the problem regarding the priors, say now we don't have the luxury of having a complete price distribution as our FOX. Instead, we can only have something very limited, like a single confidence bond in this equation two, right? This X smaller than epsilon equals to uh, theta probability. This is a confidence bond on the variable X. And we call it partial knowledge in the sense that this confidence bond is far from being specific about a single and complete distribution f of x. Rather, it says something very minimum, very flexible, so that there is actually a infinite number, a infinite set of distributions can satisfying this partial knowledge equation too. Okay, and now the question is. In this infinite set of price distributions satisfying equation two, which one should I use in my Bayesian reasoning? In a sense, which one is the worst case prior in this set, giving me the most conservative posterior of my interest? Now you can see that we are formulating this Bayesian inference problem as a optimization problem. That is, we would like to minimize this equation one which is the posterior confidence. Why minimizing? Because that's the meaning of being conservative for posterior confidence, right? We want the confidence to be as small as possible. Subject to the prior knowledge represented by equation two, and what's the optimized uh, FOX? What's the optimized prior distribution? Okay, so this is the uh, optimization problems I'm trying to solve. Um, and it turns out this optimization problem can be solved analytically, meaning we have some formal guarantees on the conservatism. Okay, so for instance, uh, for the concrete problem I just mentioned, uh, minimize uh, the objective one, uh, objective function one, subject to the equation two, which is the uh, prior knowledge. The worst case pair could be one of those five distributions I'm highlighting in this uh, top right corner really depends on the combinations of some uh, pr uh, parameters like the K, the number of uh, fidelities, the number of tests, which is N, and the two parameters, epsilon and theta in the prior confidence bound. So really depends on those, uh, depends on the values of those uh, parameters. We may have uh, different situations and that with different uh, Price distribution, worst case price distribution. Um, and here I would like to make a note. In our solution, we are not assuming any parametric family for our priors. So we are not leveraging any uh, conjugacy in our reasoning. That makes our approach being different to uh, some topics like uh, robust Bayesian inference, imprecise probability, uh, where they also have this idea, this rough idea of using a set of priors. Um, yeah, so I would say um, we have more um, results, more interesting uh, insights in these five publications I'm highlighting here uh, uh, for different forms of prior knowledge, posterior observations, and uh, application context. Uh, on the right, I'm sh only showing you a very quick example compared to the uh, run study. And as you can see, the um, the y-axis here is representing 
uh, fatality free miles needed to be driven so that we can claim some bound P okay, on the X axis with 95% uh, confidence. And uh, you can see the run result is in the middle, is this straight line in the middle, which is actually uh, the same as a Bayesian method using a uniform prior. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you do the reasoning using a non-informative Zephyrus prior, which is this dotted line in the middle, uh, the result turns out to be slightly more uh, optimistic than the, uh, than the uh, run result. At the same time, our result we call uh, CBI, stands for conservative Bayesian reasoning in the papers. Uh, our results, our CBI with strong prior knowledge is this green dashed line here showing indeed we can save a lot of testing if you have very strong prior knowledge in safety uh, at the same time being conservative. And on the other hand, if we have a, a very weak prior knowledge in safety before doing the testing, uh, it turns out we actually need much more testing than the run result. Uh, that is this um, dotted curve at the top. And, and, I, I, and I think the punchline here is the run result is good, but it is only representing one possible scenario in reality. Really depends on the prior knowledge you have for your safety critical systems. They actually may have better or worse result than the run result. Well, at the same time, our result is guaranteed to be conservative. Okay, so that's the punchline here. Um, yeah, move on. Move on, I'm thinking about this question. Um, can we actually have more interesting uh, prior knowledge? Say, instead of having something regarding a single safety critical system, what if we can say something about different versions of safety critical systems? And actually, this is something quite common in practice, okay? Like required by the safety regulation principles, say in this, um, Gali or Gala, I don't know how to pronounce, but it stands for uh, globally at least equivalent. It's uh, required by, say, uh, in the French railway. And also in the US, FDA, they have something similar for uh, medical devices, but with a different name. Uh, I can't remember. But essentially, this principle requires we have high confidence that the new system should be no worse than the existing system on the market. So can we? Can we leverage such knowledge in our reasoning? And the answer is for sure, yes, we can do this. Say we have two variables, variable Y representing the uh, failure probability of the new version um, of the safety critical system. And X is the failure probability of the old version of the safety critical system. Then this equation here I'm pointing at is formalizing uh, we have high confidence that uh, the new version should be uh, no worse than the old version, okay? And we can actually visualize such formalized per knowledge on the joint distribution of the failure probability of the two versions by cutting the support of this joint distribution into different regions and think of how to allocate probability mass in each region. Okay, to give you a example to understand what I'm seeing here is that uh, you can think of um, the sum, okay, the probability mass sum of the reason uh, five, seven, and three, which is essentially the three regions below the diagonal on the support of this joint distribution equals to phi is saying the new system B is no worse than the old system A, okay? And similarly, uh, we can say the probability mass, okay, in the region one, four, and five, okay, equals to theta is representing our prior knowledge on the marginal confidence bound on the uh, old version A, okay? And again, by doing this, by visualize the prior knowledge in this way, you can see we are introducing constraints on possible prior distributions. Although now we are working on a uh, two-dimensional space. We have two versions of safety critical systems. Um, 
Yeah, so similarly, as I mentioned, we formulate this space inference problem in this scenario uh, with two versions of uh, uh, shift critical systems as a new optimization problem. But uh, yeah, uh, we are working now, we are working on two variables in a joint uh, 2D uh, distribution. Uh, that is, say, uh, to give you an example, uh, we would like to be uh, conservative by minimizing this objective function, which is a posterior confidence, confidence bound on the failure probability of the new system B. Okay, Y is smaller than PB. PB is a bound on the new system given, say, from the uh, regulator. After seeing testing results of both the old A system and the B system. So that is something we would like to know subject to some prior knowledge, like a confidence bound on the old system. Presuming you have run the old system for many years, you have some knowledge, at least you have some knowledge about it. And the new system is no worse than the old one, okay? With some confidence phi. Um, again, we solve this um, optimization problem analytically. We have some interesting results for the autonomous vehicle example. It depends on the uh, observations we have for both versions. And we have, uh, it depends on the prior knowledge we have. I refer you to these three publications um, for more uh, interesting insights and research questions. And essentially, on the right, on the right of this, uh, yeah, on, the, on this right hand side figure, it shows some. Uh, interesting result that to claim to solve this uh, formalized optimization uh, depends on the uh, free, free testing of the, a, of, of the A version of the B version, what can you claim about uh, the system, about the self driving car. Um, I omit the details. Um, okay, so now let's forget about the price for a while. Let's focus on the likelihood. Okay, so ideally, we would like to uh, allow some doubts uh, in the fundamental assumptions behind a likelihood function in our reasoning. Okay, so how can we formalize such doubts in our reasoning? And one example we recently worked on is to use this clauses model. I'm showing you this publication here, this very old clauses model to relax the IID assumption in the reasoning. IID stands for uh, identical independently distributed testing in the uh, Bernoulli process. We can actually relax this assumption by using this uh, clauses model. Okay, and in this clauses model, assuming IID is actually only a special case when you have uh, uh, this special case when your x is equal to uh, lambda, okay, referring to this model here. And the DAOs in IID can be represented by certain combinations of these two model parameters, okay? So loosely speaking, um, in our work, instead of assuming a single likelihood function, again, we now introduce a set of likelihood functions allowing DAOs uh, leveraging this uh, clauses model uh, so that they can have a set of likelihood functions, okay? And every single likelihood function inside the set is representing some level of DAOs with the, uh, on the ID assumption, okay? And assuming IID is just one special case. It's just one element in that set, okay? And again, non surprisingly, we reduce this problem as a, a optimization problems. Um, but now, this time, we are optimized over a set of likelihoods. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, here, I'm showing you some very quick results. Uh, hopefully, you may find it interesting. That is, uh, in this figure on the x axis, it, it is representing the number of testing the number of tests we have done. And the y-axis is the posterior confidence in a bound, again, given, say, from the regulator. And different curves are representing different levels of DAOs in the IID assumption. And this DAOs is characterized by this uh, variable phi2. And you can see uh, the special case of assuming IID is represented by the black dotted curve, by this black dotted curve at the top, in the figure. Um, yeah. 
Uh, we have uh, some uh, interesting insights from this recent TSE paper, uh, like, uh, um, yeah, maybe before I introduce that, uh, we can um, say something about this figure on the right. So uh, essentially, you can see in this figure, uh, when we only observe, when we only observe failure free evidence, you can see that in the IID case, okay, in the IID case, I'm referring to that black dotted line, the posterior confidence is always monotonically increasing to the number of failure free evidence, okay, but such monotonicity is not the case if you have doubts in IID assumption, that is more testing, more failure free testing uh, actually can harm your poster confidence in some cases because of the doubts. And more generally, you can see uh, the more doubts you have in the assumption, uh, the less confidence you have in a poster count uh, bond. Uh, this is uh, looks like uh, yeah, quite uh, uh, intuitive. And we have more interesting insights in our recent publication in this TSE paper, uh, like assuming IID is actually not always being optimistic, it really depends on the uh, failure patterns, like if the failures are coming as a cluster, or if the failures are coming in a isolated manner, okay? And in some cases, the posteriors are not sensitive to the dots at all. I think this is very important to note. This is uh, something very interesting. We find out in some cases, the poster confidence are not sensitive to the dots at all. So in this case, you can feel assured in your reasoning to use the dots. Okay, I will mention a use case based on this assumption that is to do a model validation. Um, yeah, I think it's a good idea to have a quick summary before uh, we move on. So essentially what we have seen so far is uh, looking at this Bayesian theorem again, we don't use a single prior distribution f of x nor a single likelihood function l. Instead, we use a set of priors that are uh, represented by very limited partial prior knowledge and a set of likelihoods that allowing us to have doubts in the assumptions behind the stochastic failure process uh, of the safety critical systems. And we can provide formal guarantees on the conservatism for the given posterior because we can do analytical solutions. And uh, yeah, how we did this, uh, we uh, reduced this problem, this basic inference problem as a optimization problem and proof and trying to prove, trying to find out somehow the worst case combination of the priors and the likelihoods in the uh, Cartesian product of the set of priors and the set of likelihoods. So that is the gist, I think. And in this whole process, I would like to note, we don't assume any parametric family, no controversy anywhere. Uh, we always try to get analytical results. And you may think of uh, why we need analytical results, not only because we need formal guarantees for safety critical systems, but also my collaborators, sorry, but also we believe, uh, I mean, my uh, collaborators at York, we believe um, this, this set of Bayesian techniques can be used for, for runtime, can be used for as Bayesian runtime estimators for uh, model driven engineering works like uh, what I'm about to present next. Um, yeah, so far, uh, we have been modeling safety critical systems at a very high level, okay? Very high level means we normally use a single variable to represent the reliability of each safety critical system, okay? Well, in the model-driven engineering community, like what uh, Sinway, Radu, and Simos uh, did in the, uh, at, at York, they normally formalize the dynamic system behaviors as uh, Markov models, say uh, DTMC, CTMC, MDP, and specify some critical properties using formal logics. And then they do verification, say using uh, probabilistic model checking um, to verify those property, uh, properties either offline or at runtime. Okay, so for example, uh, we may have a underwater vehicle here doing some uh, underwater asset inspection mission, and we can use 
uh, this right hand side uh, Markov chain to uh, form uh, to represent the dynamic system behaviors, dynamic uh, uh, robotics missions, and do some verification over this model for some uh, critical properties. Um, yeah, so that's the use case. But uh, I would say one typical criticism of such works, such model driven works, often face is your formal verification result is only as good as the formal model. Okay, so in the context of probabilistic model checking, that is, how can we know you have an accurate mark of chain to represent your robotics behavior? Okay, say, uh, what if I don't know uh, some key transition parameters, say this x, y in this model? Okay, what if uh, the formal model is actually subject to sudden changes in the robotics missions? How can we detect? The change point and what would be the new transition probability, the new formal model after the change point. Okay. And I will say all these questions are very good, very interesting questions, and they can actually be formulated as statistical inference problems. Say use Bayesian estimators to solve them at runtime with fresh and up to uh, up to date mission data. Okay. So that we can have an accurate representation of the model. And we may use all, this, all those aforementioned ideas, uh, again, to tackle some uh, generic problems when we use Bayesian methods, like where to get priors, what is the likelihood, and so on. And remember, um, our techniques I mentioned earlier have analytical solutions. That means they are very efficient for runtime verification in this use case. Um, yeah, together with colleagues at uh, uh, York, like Radu, Simos, Colin, uh, we actually did some case studies of applying those uh, Bayesian estimators for underwater vehicles. Uh, I'm sharing a link here. I don't think I have time to play it in this talk. Um, uh, yes, but also, uh, but if, if, if you are interested, you can have a watch later. And also we have some publications and more are coming uh, under review. Um, yeah, you can have a read later. But I think the general idea is accumulated very well in this figure, in this picture. Actually, this uh, from uh, Radu. So essentially, in this figure, you can see uh, we have a monitor system and we record different types of observations in advance happened during this robotics mission. And then we invoke different types of basin estimators uh, to have some bounded estimates on the key model parameters. And then we use a model generator to synthesize a, a, a CTMC model and then feed this synthesized model into some model checker to check properties like safety, reliability, response time, and so on. And uh, whenever there is a violation of those properties, we can reconfigure the controller to make sure that the uh, properties are satisfied again in this uh, case study. Uh, move on. Okay, so I think I think that's basically um, what I I would like to to discuss in today's talk. And some take home messages uh, representing my my own view here is first, whenever we do safety, uh, sorry, whenever we do uh, statistical testing for safety critical systems, no one actually starting from knowing nothing. Okay, otherwise it would be too risky and too uh, too expensive. We must already have some prior knowledge in safety. So the question is how to incorporate such prior knowledge in our reasoning. And most importantly, we must do this in a principled way. Okay. So to me, it, it looks like the only answer is to do Bayesian inference. Okay. That's my first personal view. Second, um, we know that Bayesian inference is hard to, 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 to apply. As I mentioned, those, all those questions about uh, priors, about likelihoods, okay? So before we can turn on the Bayesian machine for our reasoning, okay, we should think of first uh, how to elicit and formalize a prior distribution, okay? I would say, okay, it is fair that you cannot have a complete prior distribution uh, in your reasoning, but at least, you can say something very minimum as limited as a confidence bond, which is arguably much easier. 
And also do not simply use a uniform or non-informative priors for your safety critical systems for many reasons, like actually you are implicitly introducing many prior knowledge uh, when you use a, say, a non-informative priors because you are equivalently specifying an infinite number of confidence bonds when you use a complete prior distribution. If you cannot give me a single confidence bond, why you can specify an infinite number of confidence bounds by using a non-informative price, okay? Um, yeah, and also, even if you use those uh, non-informative price, uh, uniform price, uh, you normally cannot get anything useful from those priors. So why bother, okay? And the next message I would say is regarding the doubts in the assumptions in the behind the uh, likelihood function. And we should model those doubts in our reasoning, like what we have done. And uh, as I mentioned, I, at, at least I see there are two use cases here. The first, if you are happy to give numbers for the doubts, okay, then good for you. You can get some conservative claims. But if you still can, sorry, if you still feel uncomfortable to give numbers for those doubts, you can use our technique for model validation. That means you can do what if calculations and see if your claims are sensitive to the doubts or not. Ideally, the safety claims you are making should be insensitive to those doubts. And our technique can tell you yes or not. Okay. And don't, uh, and don't forget that we, in our techniques, we don't need conjugacy. We don't assume parametric families. You cannot justify, that for, uh, just, uh, justify those assumptions for safe critical systems. So never bother with that. And finally, I would say uh, the ideas and the techniques I mentioned here are actually quite versatile and efficient at different levels of uh, modeling, different abstraction levels. They can either estimate uh, a single reliability matrix or uh, can be used as different types of basic estimators for the underlying uh, models in the model-driven community. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. I'm showing a list of publications related to this talk. If anything looks interesting to you and you don't have access, feel free to let me know. I can share you a copy. Uh, yeah, so journal publications, conference, uh, sorry, conference publications, and... Uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Uh, my contact details, if you uh, yeah, would like to discuss later. Yeah, thank you. Back to you, Xinwei. Right, thank you, uh, Xinwei, for the insightful presentation. Now we roughly have a 10 minutes for questions yep. from the audience. Anyone want to raise their hands or? Well, I can start with, um, I got a question. So. We start to see the increasing use of AI components in safety critical systems. So mm -hmm. do you think the use of those components brings additional challenges in evaluation of the systems? Uh, yes, I think so. Yes, I think so. The answer what is yes. Are they? What are they? Can you give an example from your point of view or your experience? Um, uh, my answer could be very cliche to most of you, like the uh, you know the uh, black box nature, right? So in that case, we may have even more difficulties to get some prior knowledge about your machine learning models, right? This black box is not written in code, right? We can, yeah, more difficult uh, to get prior knowledge. That first one, and second, um, the input space is very large, right? And actually, uh, I think. For a single machine learning software, it has not reached to the safety critical level. So that means the failure rate, failure probability of a single machine learning software is not for now, for now, only for now, is not at the level of say 10 to minus four, 10 to minus six. But after we pair with the machine learning software with the safety monitors, actually, my personal view here is it can achieve ultra high reliability. So all the problems I'm highlighting here. Okay, actually valid for machine learning software paired with safety monitors. Yeah. All right, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, Simmels? You're muted. Yeah, you're muted, Simmels. Mm 
let me see. Is it better now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. Thanks to you. Uh, as I said, you gave more credit than me. That. Uh, so <laughs> what? You know, my my. Uh, what if the the experts are are incorrect? What would happen? Or if the assumptions of the experts do not do not hold because they are too biased. Uh, to be honest, as a mathematician, that's not all of. I mean, that's not part of my research. I, but I think from the practical point of view, that is something very good. We should have some um, scientific based approach to elicit a to, sorry to elicit per knowledge from assessors, say a group of assessors or um, some experiments, right? Some carefully designed questionnaires. I don't know, but. Um, yeah, we should. I agree, essentially, I agree with you. It, 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 could, it could go wrong, and we should have some scientific based method to eliciting per knowledge, even if we only need something very limited. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm -hmm. but 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 in principle, it is a case that I assume that even if they are wrong, given enough time, the method would be able to calibrate. But it is the question of how how long that would take, right? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, that point is uh, something regarding the data eventually will speak for themselves. Okay, right. So if you feed in enough data for a very long time, eventually your prior doesn't matter, right? Your posterior is weighted more on the uh, data you have. Uh, but again, for safety critical systems, we should be very careful here. We should not only let the data to speak, because for many reasons I mentioned, like uh, you, have, you need uh, probably many data, right? And uh, uh, yeah, it could be uh, misleadingly optimistic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Because, because because you can imagine that for a safety critical system, what you have seen is always is is failure free evidence. So in this case, what can you claim? Can you claim your know, system is perfect? If you only let the data speak for themselves, right? So yeah, we should be careful here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Samuels and uh, Shinri. Any more questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. No. Um, I actually have a second one. So. As you mentioned, we kind of evaluate it based on the model, which the model itself is a, we, we kind of model is as a best representation of the reality. But at a runtime, we actually can observe the, 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 the feedback of the real system reflects in the model, right? So is there any way that we can tell the model itself is not a good representation of the uh, actual system anymore? Or how, if we could, how can we differentiate whether that is um, the model's problem or the system's problem? If I make um, it clear. Yeah, I think I think I'm following your questions. I agree, and um, I'm sure that um, I'm sure that there are a lot of techniques, including Bayesian commanders, for uh, your question. So, uh, to give you an example. In my research, I've been using. Uh, uh, prior date confliction detection in a BSN scheme again uh, to detect if there are some, uh, I mean, if there is conflict between what I believe at the beginning of the, say, robotics mission and what is happening, what is collected from the robotics mission. If there is a complete uh, a conflict, there's something wrong. Either, as you mentioned, the model is wrong or the system has some changes. So, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there are some, um, yeah, techniques. Outside here, yeah. All right, thank you very much. So, if we don't have more questions, um, let's like thank you, Xingyu, again, um, for an insightful presentation, and we shall see you all in the next seminar. Cool. Thank you, thank you, guys. Thank you very much.